would, uh, please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter, where do you want to go this morning? Why don't we go to chapter 16? Um, we finished Luke recently, and uh, we're going to start in Acts very soon. So I would encourage you to begin reading there. Um, today, as I mentioned, is our uh, 25th anniversary. Technically, it was on February 28th. We uh, began as a Bible study on, June, on January 7th in 1999, and we had our first Sunday morning service uh, in a little preschool room at Camp Curiosity at the barn. Um, I, I look back, you know, 1999, Aris wasn't born, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> Neither have some, were some of our staff. Uh, but... <laughs> um, yeah, it's a, suddenly I feel like the old guy, but <laughs> no, some are very close. Uh, <laughs> anyhow, uh, but you know, I think 1999, that was a, the world was a much simpler place. It, it really is kind of weird to think that, but you know, I didn't think that in 1999, but uh, I, I look back and think, you know, it was kind of quaint uh, compared to where it is today. Uh, America was uh, co comparatively innocent. Uh, as a result of a very difficult church situation. I tend not to get into the details on that nowadays, but uh, Renee and I and some others um, set out to start a church. Uh, technically, it's called Plant a Church. Uh, never really wanted to. You've probably heard me say that before. People said you should be a pastor. I didn't want to be a pastor. Uh, but uh, So anyhow, we did that, and that began in September 1998. We got the boot from the other church. But just so for those of you who don't understand what I'm saying, well, you know what get the boot means. But um, we're in mixed company, otherwise I'd show you the boot print. But uh, <laughs> we, uh, it, was over, it was over some different issues. Um, one was a, uh, some were what we call style issues because we were talking about planting a church out of that church. Uh, so some style issues, disagreements over... Uh, worship, like you just experienced, um, and some other things. Attire. Um, I wasn't going to wear a tie when I preached. Those types of things. Silly stuff, actually, in my opinion. But, um, but then we got into some doctrinal issues. I'm not a heretic. All heretics tell you that. But anyhow, uh, <laughs> uh, they're just different, a couple of different doctrinal issues. Uh, one is divorce and remarriage, uh, you know, whether there are actually biblically legitimate remarriages, I believe there are, and um, the gifts of the Spirit, whether, they, whether God is still moving today as he was in the first century, I believe he is. He's the same God, why would he be different? And so, uh, and we'll look at that more in, in Acts. In any event, because of that, uh, the, the gulf was, was growing wider uh, between, uh, well, me especially, but, you know, Rene and I, and the rest of the leadership, uh, we were a part of the leadership of that church, but uh, anyhow, so we we were invited to leave, and um, and so we did. Uh, anyhow, we we set out. Renee and I, God gave us a vision for for what you're experiencing. Well, actually, we had no idea what this would look like, but anyhow, a, a vision for this new church, and uh, you know, about 20 others who became what we used to call the core group, and uh, and so we set out. We were uh, we were sincere. We were naive. We were well. That, that's which is a nice way of saying clueless about what any of this would ever look like. Uh, really, all I ever wanted to do was to have a Bible study. But and here we are. Um, and and so I want to give you some perspective on this as we look in the Word here. But I have to tell you first, as we do, as we finish these 25 years and begin to go into whatever this next chapter is going to look like. Uh, there's a part of me that has, a, I, I think we all have a sense of, I think we ought to have a sense of gravity about where we are in these last days, that we are actually in the last days. Uh, it's, it's fine to say, you know, things were quaint back in 1999, things were simpler back than they were, but what we see today is a very dark world and it's growing darker by the day. But you, you look in the Bible and you look at certain churches. I mean, a famous church, of course, was the church in Ephesus. We read a lot about the church in Ephesus in the New Testament. 
when Ephesus, or the church in Ephesus, was about seven years old, Paul met with the elders uh, in Miletus, away from, away from Ephesus, in a separate place. He met with them at the end of his third missionary journey. And he said this to them. We'll look at it when we're in Acts chapter 20, but let me just read you a little snippet out of it. He said, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves, elders, leaders of the church, a big happening church. Take heed to yourselves uh, and to the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I didn't cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. That was seven years after the beginning of the, of the work there. When it was about ten years old, Paul writes these things uh, to Timothy in 1 Timothy and in, uh, and in 2 Timothy. In 1 Timothy 4, he says, the Spirit, the Spirit says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. These are people who leave the church, is what he's saying. People who leave the faith. They all look good, they all sing the songs, but they'll leave. Giving heed to seducing spirits, doctrines of demons, uh, having... Uh, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Later on, he says in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, he said, in the last days, perilous times will come. And then he describes what people will be like. It's a long list, but for our purposes, um, you can look at that yourself. And I think we've reached much of that today in our society. And he says that uh, those people will have a form of godliness, but deny its power, turn away from them. When the church in Ephesus, I won't go on all day, but uh, when it was about 25 years old, this is when it starts to really get my attention, when the church in Ephesus was about 25 years old, it was still a happening place. Things were cooking. People were reading their Bibles. They were, there were 30 ministries in the church. There were all sorts of things happening. And Jesus writes a letter in Revelation chapter 2. And he says to them, he says, John, take a letter and write this to the church in Ephesus. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and he lists off a lot of really great things that the church was known for. And he commends them for them. Nevertheless, he says, I have this against you. You don't want to hear that from Jesus. I have this against you. Pastors and elders don't want to hear that from Jesus. I have this against you. He says, you left your first love. Therefore remember the height from which you've fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I'll come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. And of course he did. That history shows that he did. We're in our 25th year. And something is happening around here every day of the week. There's a lot of stuff, and it's good stuff. Uh, there's, I, I hear from people often, you know, we got so much going on, can't we simplify things? Well, How? That's a different question for a different time. Um, but uh, things, things are happening. There's something happening all the time. So we, we come to Matthew chapter 16. I think it's good to go back to the basics here. It's good when we're at a time like this, when we're looking at who we are, where we are, how do we get here, and then to, to say, well, where are we going? Well, that's next week. For today, let's look at where are we, how do we get here? Jesus says this, we read this in Matthew chapter 16. Actually, let me just say this. It's about a year before the crucifixion, and Jesus brings the guys up to a place called Caesarea Philippi. We're used to reading these things, and many, people, many of us know that, Caesarea Philippi. Uh, those of you, especially if you've been to Israel, you know something more about Caesarea Philippi. Um, if you, uh, in, that, in these days, uh, more and more Christians are reading things like the Book of Enoch and things like that, and you, you know something about Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon was known uh, as a place of uh, a, a lot of demonic activity. Um, Mount Hermon is the mountain. It's the biggest mountain in Israel, almost 10,000 feet. It's easily four times higher than any other mountain in Israel. And... Uh, it was historically known as a place of great demonic activity. And at the base of Mount Hermon here is where Caesarea Philippi is located. In fact, it's six days later on the top of Mount Hermon that Jesus will take 
uh, Peter, James, and John, and he'll be transfigured before them. So there's a lot really that, that happens here, and I find it to be very interesting. But for our purposes, um, he takes them to this place. This is a place that at that time was known even while Jesus was, was in, in his earthly ministry. It was a place known uh, for its very sick, filthy, creepy, I'm just, ew, spiritual activity. It, uh, today it has the name Banyas. It gets the name Banyas because the Arabic-speaking people who lived there for so long can't pronounce P, so they say B. Instead, Banyas, it was Panyas, Pan, out of, uh, after the god, you know, the demonic god, Pan. Uh, and if you've been there, you know something about what it looks like. Um, it's hard for me nowadays, to, uh, because of these things that I know, to go there and just say, oh, isn't this pretty? Because it is pretty. But knowing how creepy all these altars really are, you get, your stomach starts to turn. And um, so he takes them there. <laughs> he, tell, he takes them in the midst, because that stuff was happening. This is a year before his crucifixion. All that stuff is happening around him. He takes the guys there. And then he, he, he asks them these questions. I, I find it interesting. Why does he take them there? Why, why does he put up with it? Because he's greater than all of that. He's greater than what was happening there. He didn't come to just run it out. He came to, to establish himself. But first he has to establish it with his own guys. He takes the 12 there. And we read here in verse 13, and you, you know this, right? Jesus, it says, verse 13, came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, and he asked, who do men say that I am? And they said, well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. That's, that's what they say. And, they, and, you know, we've been through some of this before. He asked them this question, and they give these answers. They say, this is what people think. Some, some say that you're like John the Baptist. Well, Herod thought that, actually, he thought because he had killed John the Baptist, and he thought that John the Baptist had come back from the dead. He was totally freaked out uh, by who Jesus might be. Um, and others say Elijah, because there was all these miracles. Power! Isn't that interesting? Even in our day today, people are looking for that. Power! They want to see the power in ministry and the power of miracles. And all you have to do is turn on the TV to see those things. It's amazing how people think that's what the church is. Some say... That's what you are. Some say you're like Jeremiah, you know, the weeping prophet. Full of, you know, he was known as a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Right? Some think the church should be like that, 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 that we should always be so sensitive, and we should be sensitive to the needs of people. And, but that, that extrapolates sometimes into, well, the church should be this organization that goes out into the world and, and feeds all of the poor takes all, care of all of the needs. And yet, later on, he'll say, the poor you'll have with you always. He doesn't say, forget the poor, who cares about them? He's not saying that. But some people think that's what the church should be. Some say that you're John the Baptist, the great political reformer, that, that, and, and the many in the church think that's what the church should be, that we should be known by the stands we take. We should be known by the stands we take against illegal immigration, the stand we take for the wall, the stand we take for all these things. And it's not, it's not wrong to vote our values, right? But is that what Jesus came to be? I don't think so. So whether it's political reform or power and, and miracles or, or the, you know, the sentimental society or, or one of the prophets, you know, like Isaiah or Daniel, a great teacher. And he was a great teacher, Jesus. And many churches are known by that. And I think we should be teaching the word of God. Then, of course, he says, but who do you say? Really, that's the question, isn't it? And who do you say that I am? And, you know, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you've heard this question over and over again. Pastors say this stuff all the time. Who do you say that I am? Well, it is a very important question. Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you're the Messiah. You're the one we've been waiting for. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. They hadn't discussed this before, and that's why Jesus says, blessed are you. You're blessed. Ashrei, happy are you, Simon Barjona, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood. Man has not revealed this to you, but my Father who's in heaven, and I tell you that you are Petros, you're Peter, and upon this Petra rock, 
I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I'm not going into great detail on that this morning, but I think that's the point we have to, we have to focus on. What is the church? Well, the church is his. Yes, we're a part of the Calvary Chapel movement, but the church is his. This body of believers here, this local assembly, assembly here in Chalfont, it's his, not mine. It's not, we're not part of a denomination, no organization owns us, none of that. We're his. The church overall is his. And he said it's on this rock, and of course everybody wanted to, wants to get into what rocks he's talking about. That's a study for a different time. Basically, you know, and, and you know, okay. Some of you were taught it because you were raised in this church. So the Roman Catholicism will tell you that he's, because Peter's name means stone, that Jesus is saying on you, on the rock, you're the rock, I'll build my church. And, you know, he's like the first pope and all that. Of course, the first pope wasn't until the 300s, but that's a different question. The first pope must have cut off someone's ear then. Um, no, you're, you're a stone is what he's saying. On this Gibraltar, what Gibraltar? On Christ. Or on the, on the testimony of Christ. Some say, well, it's the testimony of Christ. Others say it's, it's Christ himself. Can you separate them? No, they're the same thing. It's on him. He says, I will build my church. We started out, 20 of us, to plant a church. But we didn't build anything. He's the one who built it. Because the building, sure, we can buy chairs. I bought chairs. We had a place to stay. We did things. It's good to be organized. People don't like it when you're not organized. That's fine. We should do those things. But he builds the church with people. In fact, later on, you can look for yourself, Peter will say in his first epistle, that, you know, he's the rock. We are little stones, like little stones fit together into the edifice, so to speak, of, of the overall church, the assembly that he's called to be here. On this rock, I will build my church. He says, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Yeah, there's a lot of questions you can come up with as you go through all of this. Over the years, I've watched a lot of things since 99, 25 years. I've watched a lot of things happen in the, in, in the church overall. I don't mean just here, but in the, in the church world. And y you've seen them too, you know, whether it's smoke machines. That, the first time I saw smoke machines in a church was actually in a church on the West Coast called Reality. And I thought, that's kind of interesting. It's called Reality, but they use smoke machines. Um, smoke machines, lighting, all kinds of crazy lighting and stuff like that. The interesting thing is as time went on, you know, old people like me and some of you are like, smoke machines, lightings, what are you thinking about? We're saying, oh, they're just trying to, to, to please the younger people. But increasingly, it's the younger people, it's the millennials and the Gen Zs who have said, if I want to go to a nightclub, I can go to a nightclub. They do lighting and smoke machines a whole lot better than churches, you know. Let's just sing some hymns and read the Bible together. You know, that's really what we're to do as a church. Well, I don't want to go off on all of that. We, uh, when it was time for us to, uh, to start this thing, <laughs> I don't mean to cheapen it by calling it a thing, but to, to start all of this, you know, we didn't know, Renee and I didn't know, and like I said, we had about 20 people who were a part of the group. We prayed together in our family room, and we're seeking the Lord, where are we going to go, what are we going to do? I mean, where do you meet? We didn't know. Many of you know, and, and, and by the way, for those of you who've heard the stories over and over, my apologies, but suck it up. I'm just going to tell the rest <laughs> of the people. Um, uh, we, I, gave a, I gave a phone call to uh, Bill and Ellen Thomas. You may know who they are. Uh, I don't think they're here. We invited them, but, uh, well, Bill couldn't be here because he, he went to be with the Lord about three years ago. But um, but uh, they own Camp Curiosity over on the east side of Doylestown. And I uh, said, hey, you know, we're, we're starting a church, have a Bible study, want to start a church at some point, and wondering if you had any room where, that we could rent. And they said, oh, sure, come on over. We'll walk around. So Renee and I went over there took a walk and she walked with Ellen and I walked with Bill and we sort of saw the place and, and show, show this, the, you know, this room, this room, that room, you know, and after a while I said to Bill, well, you know, 
there's a lot of opportunity or a lot of possibilities here. Uh, how much do you want for rent? He said, ah, we don't want any money. Well, no, no, come on, we've got money in the bank, we can afford to pay, the, you know, don't feel like you've got to be, you know, charitable here. Uh, and, and he said, no, really, he said, whatever God wants to do is fine. If, you know, if, 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 if you're really coming here to do the Lord's work, we believe that, and so we don't want any of your money, okay? And, uh, and so they had no clue what they were getting themselves into, um, because, you know, 30 people in a little preschool room was one thing, now, what became 200 people after t t a little after two years was quite another. And, um, and so we started off. And uh, you've probably heard this before, but all we did was buy chairs. Yes, we did more, but we bought chairs. I mean, I remember going to the uh, surplus uh, office supply place over on 309, bought 50 chairs, brought it back, set them up. The room was about 25 by 15 and uh, set up these folding chairs. And uh, believe it or not, I was leading worship back then. Uh, aren't you glad we have others leading worship now? But <laughs> that's how we know it was a move of the Spirit, because I was leading worship and we grew anyhow. And uh, I was on guitar, and Mike Semko was uh, on a bongo with a little triangle. And um, his wife, Laura, was singing. And, um, and so we began. And really, all we did was buy chairs as... as we didn't advertise. If you know where Camp Curiosity is, it's on a it's on a country road. If you've been there for the picnic, you have to f get directions to find the place. And so it's not like we advertise. We put a little sandwich board out every Sunday, say Calvary Fellowship meets here, and uh, and so we went. By the way, the the way it all began was that w um, after we were launched out of uh, the previous church. Um, Someone who also had left the church went back to Calvary Philly and spoke to Joe Foch. For those of you who don't know Joe Foch, he's the senior pastor of Calvary Philly, which is sort of like the big house. Okay, that's like the, the big, big church. And um, and they told him that you know who we were and what we were doing. There was some guy teaching verse by verse, and he said, "Well, I like to meet them." And so we met at a suburban diner one Sunday night and gave him our sad tale of woe that you know what we wanted to do, but we were kicked out, et cetera, et cetera. And so we met, and I remember him saying, you know, you'd be surprised how many Calvary pastors have a similar uh, uh, testimony as yours. And, you know, Renee and I had had about a year of Calvary Chapel experience when we were uh, in our first year of marriage. And uh, so he said, look, you understand the Calvary movement. And uh, he said, if you, uh, you want to go and start a fellowship, go ahead and do it. And many of you have heard the story before, but I said, do it. You know, what does do it mean? I'm a, I'm a marketing guy I'm at that point, you know, strategic marketing, you know. And I said, what do you mean by do it? Like, I'm an old hippie, too. And he said, just take your Bible and teach the word. If people come, it's the Lord. And if they don't, why would you want to waste your money on all these other things? But I'm like, wow, I never looked at it that way. And so that's what we did. And I say that because... Every time more people would come, I'd buy another 25 chairs. And then we, we outgrew that little room. We went into the barn, and it was a barn. It was a raw barn. Um, we, uh, uh, it was cold in the wintertime, and it was hot and humid in the summer. Uh, Dave Weisenbach, uh, he's up in Maine now, but uh, Dave was our guy who was, he's a carpenter, can-do guy, and you know, in fact, he was our, my first hospital call uh, when we were in the church. He uh, cut off the tips of his thumbs on a, on a dado saw, so we gave him the Two Thumbs Up Award. He, you know, he's the kind of guy that he could handle that, right? And, um, and so we, uh, he, he rigged the system. He figured out a way to hang these propane heaters in, the, in a wooden barn. And so we did that. And, um, and, and you know, it's kind of interesting around here. You might have noticed that people don't always come in for the first song. They, they hardly ever come in on the second. You know, I mean, usually by the fifth song, people are here. And uh, it wasn't like that back in the barn. It was cold in the wintertime. People wanted a seat under the heaters. <laughs> they got there on time. 
They got there on time. They would have bl like football blankets and things like that. It was, it was very interesting. And uh, while they didn't set up the chairs, we set up the chairs the night before. Everybody took care of picking up their chairs and bringing them back to the shed when we were finished. And You know, it's interesting. Uh, by the time we left there in, um, uh, in, in 2001, in June of 2001, there were about 200 people who were meeting, you know, for, you know, worshiping there every Sunday. And, um, and of those people, I'd say 90 to 95 percent were engaged in ministry in the church. Because, you know, some people would come in and, and they'd be like, oh, it's kind of cold in here. I don't, I don't want, this isn't my idea of a church. Or like, <sighs> it's hot in the summertime. You know, even when we took it out of the barn, no crest ventilation. We took it out of the barn and we'd be, you know, out under the tents, you know, and I'd be playing my guitar and, you know, the dew on the circuits. And I'd be, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and, and yet we grew. But people would come and say, like, I don't want to be here. So the people who stayed really wanted to be there. And almost 100% of them were engaged in ministry. I'd say we're probably about 300 people on average who are involved in some form of ministry around here now, which is a great number. When you consider that our average adult attendance is about 600 on a Sunday morning, you can kind of figure out the rest of that equation. But, um, you know, they, Bill and Ellen were very gracious to us. We... Uh, we got involved. We did many things. We tried to help them as much as we could. Uh, as the church has grown, you know, I, I, I used to be a sales guy, right? And so some of you are thinking, well, you're still a sales guy. Well, I know, but not like I used to be. And so I used to pride myself, if that's the word, on remembering people's names. Um, and as time went on, I got to the point where it's like, I, I really don't know who most of you are anymore. I, uh, <laughs> even the, one who's, the ones whose names I know. I used to be pretty good at that, you know, and I'd say to Renee you know, as, as the church started, like, now who's that guy that comes with that woman? Oh, she takes notes. I don't. And uh, I should, but I don't. And um, I, I, I finally understood after all those years, you know, you know I've gotten to know Joe over these, 20, oh, over these 25 years, and he's always calling me buddy. And I realized that he just doesn't even know who I am. <laughs> I always thought we were on good terms. Hey, buddy. <laughs> now, we've uh, so many stories. Some, some of those stories are sad. Some of them are shocking. Some are hilarious. I mean, yeah, back in the barn, you know, we had, we'd have mice running along the beams. Um, I, I may have told you this, but I remember the first time I gave uh, an altar call of sorts, but any, uh, we didn't have an altar. We didn't have a way to get people up to the front. But I remember, you know, we were, it was in May, and we were doing an altar call. And I said, look, you know, if you want to trust the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior, just where you are, stand. We do, we do that today. You know what I'm talking about. And uh, there's always that pregnant pause, that moment, you know. And then this woman, you remember Lauren Yates? Says, Lauren Yates stood up. She doesn't mind if I say that. And, um, and I remember seeing her, and then I see this thing fall from the beams. Didn't anoint her. <laughs> but anointed the woman behind her. Uh, people were always being anointed. We took that as a good sign that, that, that God was really on the move. If you, if you haven't been anointed, you know, oh yeah, yellow jackets crawling up underneath my glasses while I'm preaching. <laughs> All sorts of distractions, funny stuff, some stuff so I, I just really shouldn't tell you. But um, I remember Jack, well, one of our worship leaders, gone now, but uh, praying one morning as he's leading worship, Lord, we just fall prostate before you. And <laughs> everybody's trying to pray. <laughs> what did he just say? Did he just say? Yeah. Um, yeah, all sorts of things. But you know, it's like, but here's the thing. It was simple. And, and I, I, can't, I can't say it any other way. It was simple, and that's all we ever really wanted to be in the first place. We just wanted to worship the Lord. I come in here this morning and I'm listening to 300 people singing. I'm like, wow, Lord, we've a lot's happened in 25 years. And you know, it's it's our responsibility, not just mine, not just the heads of ministries. Of course, we get we're supposed to be doing that to be organized. 
Um, but the glory goes to him. You know, our job is just to do the job. He's the one who brings the increase. You know, the same thing in your life, by the way. Every single one of us in here, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your title is. It doesn't matter if you're engaged in ministry in some official sense, you know, so to speak, you know, here at, at Calvary Central Bucks, or if you're not. If you're born again, if you're born again, if you've been saved because of the sacrifice of the blood of Jesus Christ, you've been washed clean, you're his, number one, who are we to say, no, I just do things my way? You know, Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do the things that I say? That's a, that's a very difficult question if you'll really let yourself think about it. He's given you and me two things. The gospel, the seed of his word. Our job is to sow the seed. And he's given us his Holy Spirit. We're to water those seeds that we've sown. Some sow, some water. But he brings the increase. We, we use the phrase, I led someone to Christ. Well, okay, we all know what you mean. But none of us gets anybody saved. It's what he does. Some sow, some water. People think, well, the, the big mouth in front, he's the one responsible to vocalize. Okay, at times that is my job. The rest of the times it's your job. That's what makes a healthy church. That's part of what makes a healthy church. We're known in a lot of ways. Um, we're certainly known, I believe, by our love for one another. You know, there's a lot of ways that the church wants to be known. <laughs> Some want to be known as the John the Baptist Church, taking the political stance. Some want to be known as, as, as an Elijah church, power and miracles. And they, you know, people want to be known by that. I don't think it's biblical, but they, they want to be known that way. Some want to be known as, as the, the charity church. Nothing wrong with giving to the poor or helping the poor. There's nothing wrong with those things. But Jesus said there's one way we'll be known. The world will know that we're his by the love we have for one another by the love we have for one another. In fact, that's even in one of the distinctives that you read, if you ever read it, uh, on the back of the bulletin. That without his agape love, we have no right to call ourselves Christians. That's how we're to be known, and I believe we are known. We hear it all the time, and I want to always hear it. That, oh, such a friendly church. Every once in a while, over the years, there's been someone who says, this is the most unfriendly church I've ever experienced. You know, it was like cold water being poured down my back. It's like, what was it like at the last church you were at? <laughs> Probably a lot the same. Why don't you go? Anyhow. Um, <laughs> and, I, you know, I mentioned we prayed for Aris. But when you look at, again, this is not <coughs> to our credit. It's to God's glory. But as you, you look around uh, and, and, and what's happening in global missions, we have missionaries or a missions investment in, in so many places. We planted a church in Lansdale, but then, you know, of course, you know, Pete and Jen and their family just came back from Ecuador. But Peru, East London, you know, you know about that. In Israel, a number of places in Israel over the years, Nicaragua, Guatemala, Nepal, Pakistan, Panama, uh, South Africa, North Africa, the list goes on. Now Japan, who knows, we'll see what God does there. You and I have not been called to sit. We've been called to a race. And Paul makes it very clear that each one of us has one thing, one thing and one thing only that will, if you will, merit our salvation. And it's not anything that you or I ever do. And that is the rock, Jesus Christ. And it's on that rock. He is our foundation. It's on that rock that, that any one of us and every one of us who know him will get into heaven. But what we did with that salvation while we were here, since we've been saved, since we've been on that rock, will determine the crowns, will determine the rewards that are up ahead. 
Some will get crowns. Some will get many crowns. Some think maybe I'll just get a beanie with a propeller on top. You won't even get that. <laughs> but you'll get the rock. You'll stand on the rock. Why? Why settle for no crowns? Because many of us don't think about it. And that's one of the things I've been excited to watch over these years is the number of people who just want to serve him. Just want to serve him. Uh, many things I could go on and on. Nah, I already told you that. I'm not going to tell you that one. You know, I, 20 years, 15 years, these different times, uh, is always the question of, well, who do you thank? There's so many people, you can't, you can't just mention people without missing somebody. So, and not just because I'm married to her. But seriously, listen, without Renee, we wouldn't be here. You know, I'm taking nothing away from the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? <laughs> She's been my partner in this for 25 years. In many ways, it's really, yeah, I'm the big mouth. I freely understand that. She's the brains in the operation. You know, uh, she's my wife, certainly, and first and foremost, my best friend, my advisor. I haven't always taken her advice. <laughs> and she didn't always say, I told you so. <laughs> In, in so many ways, you know, Renee's been the eyes and ears behind the scenes in ministry. You know, she doesn't have a prominent role. There are certain churches where, you know, the pastor's wife's always up front. That's not her style. It's not my style. Um, but Renee is very active in all aspects of ministry. She knows what's happening. Um, never put this ministry before our marriage or before our children. And for that matter, our children, you know, when... When things got started in 1998, really, before the church began in 99, uh, each one of our children, Kristen was, I think, 14, John was 12, and Laurel would have been 8 years old. And each one of them got very involved. in. The, the only thing they never did was fold bulletins and say, it's only 40 bulletins. You, all you have to do is go like that. You know, I was like, ah, I'm so bored. I was like, okay. But... But they did so many other things. They, they, you know, whether it was worship team, sound, a children's ministry, the list goes on and on and on because they wanted to, not because they were compelled to do it. God has done something very powerful in our family as he's called us into this ministry. They didn't serve the church. They chose to serve Jesus. And, of course, you know, I mean, pastors, elder, elders, you know, Steve and Carol, Dave and Hinka, Scott and Bridget, Scott and Tiffany, Walbridge, Paul and Tammy, um, Chris and Jean, Don and Jeannie, Glenn and Mary Jane, Dave and Sarah. I mean, it goes on and on. There's really, in many ways, there's an enormous cloud of witnesses. Listen to this. In no particular order, listen to this. The ministries. We weren't thinking of any of this stuff. 25 years ago, men's ministry, women's ministry, youth ministry, young adults, children's ministry, financial advisory council, global missions, outreach, home fellowship, the hosts and the teachers, special needs, flourish over 50, um, grief share, family ministry, ushers, parking lot, uh, greeters, cancer support group, kid camp, like I mentioned earlier, I don't know, hundreds of, I don't know how many volunteers in that. Uh, security, hospitality, coffee, worship, sound, cleaning crew, side-by-side -side counseling, discipling, mentoring, free indeed, uh, men of purity, widows helping widows, care teams, forgive me if I've missed something. That takes my breath away to think of all these areas. And I think when I compare today to 25 years or 24 or 23 years ago, the engagement in ministry then versus now as a percentage. I think then more people got involved as a percentage, not just because they said, this is my church, but because they could tell, ooh, they need help. 
it's my opinion that, uh, and this is just not a, a backhanded way of giving a compliment, but I think that many people walk in and see things running apparently very smoothly. I think, well, I guess no one needs me. Oh, we do. You have no idea how much we do. Look, there's 15 people on staff. Easily 300 volunteers. That's 20. <laughs> think of it. Think of, think of the, 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 the differential here. 20 to 1. Volunteer versus paid. We all get paid by the Lord one way or the other. It's his church. But if this is your church, if this is where you believe God's called you, I'd encourage you, get engaged. We are in the midst of a world that's dark and growing darker and sicker by the day. Churches are moving further and further away from the truth daily. They really are. It's, it's horrifying to watch it, and yet it's encouraging because it tells me where we are. Never in the history of the church of Jesus Christ, 2,000 years, has that really been the case. You know, the Lord says uh, through Jeremiah, Jeremiah 6, stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you'll find rest for your souls. It doesn't have to be complicated. His name is Jesus. But as we move from here, I'm with Moses. He said to the Lord, Lord, if you don't go with us, we don't want to go. I don't want to go from here unless the Lord's leading us. That's why we pray for his leading. So I encourage you, um, of course, later on, you may already know this, but later on, if you would, you can uh, get yourself a piece of cake. It's always good to get early in the morning. Get a piece of cake, get your sugar up, and, um, and uh, we have complimentary mugs as gifts for everybody for 25 years. God is on the move. Uh, we'll tell you a lot more next week as we talk about where we're headed from here. But uh, I hope you'll pray with me. Let's stand.